It's good to have Trevor home. We don't have him home for much of this summer. Are you a pilot yet? Almost. I'm going to fly with this guy one day. I can't wait. Yes. Well, I know that at my age, much of my elementary school experience is irrelevant. Things have changed. Maybe this hasn't changed, and if it has, well, try to get the idea anyway. When I was a young person, there were three categories of people on the field. There were captains, there were the chosen, and there were those waiting to be chosen, hoping to be chosen. Any of you remember those days? All right. Now, sometimes I was a captain. That was a really good feeling, you see. Omnipotent in my powers at that moment. I had no fears about whether I was in or out, good or bad, up or down. My stock wasn't on the market to be worth anything or not worth anything. I got to decide who was going to be on my team and who was not, at least if I could get to the choice before somebody else did on the opposite side. That was a good place to be. But if I wasn't captain, we were all there, and you could, after a while, predict how things were going to go. Kerry was going to be the first choice. He was so athletic and so capable, and if he wasn't a captain, he was going to be number one. And you could just go right down the list. You had your A stringers, your B stringers, your C stringers, and you had your, well, okay, I'll take some of you may have been on that side of the being picked uh, curve, and if that's the case, I'm sorry. There was something, though, about being chosen, ultimately. And if you were chosen, one of the things that it motivated you to do was work really hard for your team. You wanted to prove somehow that you were worthy of the faith vested in you, the choice that had been made to recruit you to the team. Is that story completely irrelevant or, or is that still happening today? Does anybody know? It's still happening today? All right, wow. Okay, Jill, let's just note that not everything from our childhood is completely irrelevant. So much has changed and moved on. There's something powerful about being chosen. It's like that engagement night when you made a choice as to who your spouse would be. That closeness and intimacy, that, that wonder of, yeah, I belong to this person, this person belongs to me. And that was confirmed all the more at your wedding. Maybe it was something else for which you were chosen. I, I've told my adoption story. That was in my household always a chosen story. My mom and dad would frame our adoptions in terms of being chosen. And as children, that was particularly powerful and meaningful to us. We always understood that, not only in light of our nuclear family, but in light of our Heavenly Father and His family. God had chosen us too. There was something really deeply satisfying and meaningful about that. And so today what I want to communicate with you and to you, and it's so simple and yet I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to labor it a bit here, because psychologically accepting something emotionally is very different than accepting something intellectually. Coming to terms with something spiritually is not the same as coming to terms with something athletically or in the field, although we know that emotionally our responses to not being chosen or being chosen first or early as it were in a game influenced our emotion, it influenced our sense of well-being, it influenced our spirits, it shaped our experience in elementary school and high school for one direction or another. I'm not trying to parse out different categories of experience for us because we're one being. And yet I can say from experience that it's just harder to get our minds around what it means to be chosen spiritually than what it means to be chosen athletically or personally in some other, other way. 
Because the way we have been chosen by God has a, has a, a link in salvation history. We're going to trace that just a little bit. We're going to look at the way we've been chosen from the time of the beginning, from Genesis, basically. The way in which we've been chosen through the, through the arm of salvation history, going through Abraham and Israel and Christ, the apostles and the church, and coming down to the present day. And how... More importantly, we have been chosen from the foundations of the world. Do we understand that text? I'm not sure I do completely. But let me try to parse that for you. You see, from the foundations of the world means, to me, from the moment of creation, from the beginning of time. However you want to parse that, whatever that looks like in your understanding, from the creation of the world, you were chosen by God to be his precious one, his special creation, his special redemption, his special person. That's very, very difficult to get our, our minds around but really, really meaningful. Let's take a look at a couple of texts. I want to just highlight briefly the call to worship text that was read just a few moments ago by Victor. In this Hebrew parallelism, three times it says, praise the Lord. It says, praise the name of the Lord, praise him, you servants of the Lord, three times. Verse 1, this was a device in poetry, Hebrew poetry, a way of helping people get their minds around the goodness or the necessity of something. You who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise him for he is good and that is pleasant. Verse 4, for the Lord has chosen Jacob to be his own. Who was Jacob? Jacob was the grandson of Abraham who had been given a great promise. Jacob was a twin who had, through deception, claimed a birthright. Jacob was a shepherd, a domestic. His brother Esau was a hunter. Jacob was a beloved child to his mother and a co-conspirator with, with, co with his mother against his brother Esau to claim the blessing. For Isaac loved Esau. And it was all in God's plan. It was all what God had chosen as we read these texts. The psalmist goes back and says, I chose Jacob. Jacob, that rascal, that deceiver, that dishonest one. Jacob, that one who stole his brother's blessing. Jacob, that one, the text says, I chose Jacob. Where are you? Maybe you're not in too honorable a place right now. Maybe you're the rascal or the dishonest one, or you've got an issue in your life that's unresolved, don't we all? Maybe you're coming from a place where you're not yet transformed by the grace of God. You've been chosen. Substitute your name and you have been called. This is your moment of election. I called Jacob. How do I know that this is important? I'll give you a clue because it says immediately after that, he chose Israel to be his treasure, treasured possession. Now here, David writing would understand that two ways. Obviously, he's referring to his people, the nation, but he is referring more importantly to the name, how that nation came to be Israel. That nation came to be Israel because Jacob became Israel. On that night of revelation when he wrestled with God, on that night of revelation 
when he would not let go of this being until this being blessed him. That night, Jacob wrestled with God. His name became Israel at the moment he was touched and subdued and made lame. Jacob the rascal, Jacob became Israel from that time forward. You see, God chose him before he was straightened out, if you will, before he had acknowledged his ways. And God chose him after he had touched him and after he had lame, made him lame and after he had changed him. Both before and after is referred to in this psalm. Chosen. It's hard to comprehend. The children's song helps us. Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, though it makes him very sad. I have a little trouble with that last part theologically. Jesus would be crying constantly. Not just for me, but there's enough badness in the world to keep him absolutely sobbing for eternity. I don't think that that's the case. But he loves us whether we've acknowledged our election or not. He loves us whether we've recognized our calling or not. He loves us whether we have come to the place where we're ready for a new name. Oh, that's an aside that's worth going down. You do know that we will all have new names. Just as Jacob became Israel and Saul became Paul, one day God will look at you and give you a new name. Greg will be something else. I don't know what yet. Looking forward to that. We'll be part not of the old world, but a new heaven and a new earth. I think Jeff is going to talk more about that next week. There's something really really powerful about this passage that just helps us understand before we put our house in order, before we pretended to be something else, before we became something else because of his initiative and his love and his care, he chose us to be his own. Our Old Testament reading in Deuteronomy expanded on that. That's really uh, wonderful to sense this expansion and clear. Sometimes I wonder why God chose a people to be his people. Why did he pick a favorite, as it were? Why does it look like some peoples were targeted for eradication and others were targeted for privilege? Why would God do something like that? And I don't know the full answer. I'm going to have to get to that one day face to face. My Understanding of that will have to be um, completed eschatologically when Jesus comes at the end of time, when I get to see him face to face. But we understand Israel's election to be based again in Israel the person, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the process or the promises that were made to them. Israel's grace, as it were, was an expansion of that promise to the generations that followed there's also lots of archaeological evidence for the ruin that the countries around Israel were in. The Canaanites were in trouble. Incurable venereal diseases were rampant. Uh, there wasn't a way to intermarry and bring them into the community. For that reason, probably among others, including idolatry that was grotesque in its forms. Human sacrifice... Um, temple prostitutes, all sorts of things that were incompatible with the worship of Yahweh. And so those people ended up being driven out and destroyed. I don't have a way of justifying that in contemporary terms, except to say that the God, God chose a people that he might demonstrate his grace and his love. It says 
why he didn't. It says, verse 7, the Lord did not set his affection on you or choose you because you were more numerous than other people's. But it was because he loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors. It was because ultimately he would redeem you from slavery and the hand of the Pharaoh. It would be because you might have some idea that the Lord is your God and that he is faithful and that you might keep his covenant. He's faithful to those who do keep his covenant to a thousand generations. So we have that passage uh, that was also read again and what it communicates. There are so many others. I won't take a great deal of time, but turn with, your, we, turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. And then it goes on praising the Lord. Here's a reference to a covenant, covenant with a chosen one. A chosen one within a chosen people. But God says, or the psalmist says, God's love stands forever. He's made his covenant and sworn it forever. You've been chosen. As David was, as Israel was as part of something bigger than the present, as something that's part of an extenuating line of salvation history. Psalm 105, another reference. We're gonna to go to verse 42. Psalm 105, verse 42. It's just a little bit further in your Bible. Again, poetry. Parallelism, and here we go. For he remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. He brought out his people with rejoicing. Now that happens to be a reference to the Exodus, but it's also a reference to Abraham and his family coming out of Ur of the Chaldees to a place God would take them. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. He gave them the lands of the nations, and they fell heir to what others had toiled for that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord, there's covenant. You will obey my precepts and laws and I will be your God. That gets modified, by the way, and we're not gonna get into that. I've done that before with you, the covenants and the change. Ultimately, God writes his law in our hearts. Ultimately, Christ stands as the new covenant, his blood, the communion service. But this is what we have. There are many other passages we could go to. It might be worth just looking again at the text we read in Matthew 12, Jesus' own ministry. Matthew 12, verse 15, God's chosen servant. Jesus has just declared himself Lord of the Sabbath as he's healed a man with a withered hand. The Pharisees were plotting to kill him, and aware of this, Jesus withdrew. A large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah. Here is my servant, whom I've chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Here is my chosen servant. Jesus, son of God, sent of the Father is the chosen servant. The chosen one to proclaim justice and good news. The chosen one to change the order of things. Well, we 
can trace it from the beginning, from the foundation of the world to the anticipation of a Messiah, to an Abrahamic promise, a promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the 12 sons and 12 tribes, and to Israel, to David as a priestly line, and then to Jesus, born of a priestly line, born of a tribe of Israel, born a Jew, but with a much wider purpose. Jesus, God's chosen servant, comes to communicate how the Father feels about us. Jesus, God's chosen servant, comes to tell us that we are not at odds with God, that he is reconciling us to the Father in himself. He's inviting us to a feast at which he'll provide a garment. He's providing grace and forgiveness if we'll but acknowledge where we stand. If we'll be able to say, my name is Greg, knowing that my name won't always be that, but one day he'll have another name for me. If we can stand before him saying, I am Jacob, and wrestle with him and be called Israel. If we can be a, a, a group misguided as Paul was, Saul, as he was known then, persecuting the church, stoning Stephen, we might have hope as we take on a new name, Paul. Little, not just referent to a physical manifestation, but humble. It's a powerful thing to be chosen. A few of you know, the board maybe knows. For some time now, I've thought maybe I would pursue more education. It's challenging. It's stimulating. I love, I love it. It enriches my mind and, and helps my ministry. And I made an honest attempt last year to get into a Doctor of Ministry degree program and could not get in because my own preparation went a different direction. I wasn't uh, pre-qualified, as it were, to make that. It wasn't a matter of whether I had the skill or the mind, but I could not be chosen because my particular preparations weren't right for that particular degree. A couple of weeks ago, I realized how very much I wanted to continue my educational process, though, and applied to Claremont School of Theology in their practical theology program, education and formation. I had no real hope that at such a late moment I might find myself chosen, that I might find myself accepted. But this last Tuesday I got really good news. Happy birthday to me. I have seven years of hard work and torture ahead. And uh, the great news about the program is, of course, I wouldn't have pursued it if I couldn't continue serving all of you and continue serving in ministry. So um, if I have to make changes in my life, which I'm sure I will, I intend to take those off the conference side of my involvements, not so much the local church side of my involvements. But I'm just, uh, I can't tell you what it was like to get a letter and say, you have been accepted. Ah, oh, me? Chosen? I'm on the team? I'm in the group? I get the chance to try myself at this? So visceral. So real. If you look at my Facebook page, I'm already signed up for the incoming class of 2014. My wife jokingly said, how long can it be before we see keychains and license plate holders? <laughs> I'll be preaching in a CST t-shirt before too long. Now I make fun of it, but you know what I'm talking about. You know these things that are important to your heart, passionate to you, and when God opens that door, there's just something amazing transformational about that moment whatever happens 
you have been given a letter. It's not from CST. It's from God. And it says, you are my chosen treasure. You are acceptable to me. You are my beloved one. You I want with me forever. You I've given myself for. You are my treasure. And you are. You each have been chosen from the foundation of the world, from the moment of creation, from the time Christ cried out, it was finished on the cross. You've been chosen. He's loved you with an everlasting love. You're his if you want to be. And he loves you so much you don't even have to be. Out of all that, you can still say no. Still say, thank you. I have my own ideas, my own plans, my own vision. I'm creating my own future. Talk about grace. He loves you enough to let you walk that path. I don't. I don't love you that much. I'm going to say, no, don't do that. Respond. Take the, take the grace. Go with, I am chosen. Thank you, Jesus. It's so powerful. And it'll mean so much in your life. I want to read Revelation 17 this morning. I could read a number of other passages, but I don't think we have time. Revelation 17. We have this terrible beast and all these descriptions that are uh, scary and something for us to parse. But in verse 14, it says, They make war against the Lamb who is Jesus. But the Lamb will triumph over them because he is, he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be his called. I add for emphasis, his chosen. And for emphasis, his faithful ones. Dare I say, you? You? 